Well, brethren, let me ask you to turn with me to the book of Romans. Uh, we'll be looking at Romans chapter 3 in a moment or two. And uh, as you do that, uh, I'll begin by expressing my delight and sense of privilege in having been invited to be with you at this conference and to share with you from God's Word. I also quickly add a word of thanks to you for your prayers. Most of you have assured me of that as we have mingled here uh, at the loss of our son. In fact, it's exactly two months ago when our son Mwansa went to be with the Lord. And thank you very much for your prayers. And also, it's been uh, encouraging to hear the testimonies of those of you who have gone ahead of us in that experience and to, to know that you can actually survive it. Uh, it's, uh, it's a difficult time, but um, it's a journey that is still very much in the hands of a very capable God. Nothing has taken him by surprise, so thank you very much. I will just read to you from verse 21 to verse 26 of Romans chapter 3. And then um, I want us to consider the topic of the death of Christ. The death of Christ. The Apostle Paul begins this section with the words, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. As we're thinking about remembering Jesus Christ, I think all of us who are familiar enough with the Gospels will realize that there are accounts of our Savior, but as you make your way through each of them, and they are getting fairly close, to the cross, to the crucifixion of Christ, the authors seem to slow down. It's as though they were running, and then now they are literally almost at standstill, wanting us to drink in a lot more of what is taking place there. So from galloping over years, they go into days, they go into hours, minutes, and you almost feel as though they are now taking in second after second, especially as Jesus Christ hangs on the cross. Why is that? It's because the death of Christ is really the center of the message of the Bible. It is the center of what we call the gospel, the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that comes prior to his suffering on the cross basically builds towards it. So as we think in terms of the person of Christ, in terms of him being God and man, the whole process of his incarnation, his very life on earth, the 30 plus years that he spent before finally going to the cross, all that is building towards 
the cross, including the many miracles that he performed in healing the sick and raising the dead and feeding the hungry and so on. It's all pointing ultimately to the one who must finally bear our sins upon the cross. And then everything after that literally gravitates from the hill of, of Calvary. And when we think, for instance, later on, we'll be thinking about his intercessory work. Again, the foundation of that intercessory work is the fact that he has paid the price for the sins of his people. Without the cross, the intercessory work falls flat before the very face of God. And all the way to the final message that we will be listening to, which will be the, uh, the wedding feast of the Lamb, the very fact that he is being referred to as the Lamb is meant to point back to the Lamb that died on our behalf, that was sacrificed in order to do away with our sin. So as we come to the, the subject of the death of Christ, we, we, we've basically come to the heart of the gospel. It's, it's why Jesus Christ came. And it's the very reason why when his disciples were rather aghast at the thought that he should be telling them that he's going to Jerusalem to die, Jesus was able to look especially Peter in the face and say, get thee behind me, Satan. Because that's the reason he came. He came that he might die. In the passage that I have just read to you, my interest is in the 25th verse, where the Apostle Paul uses rather different words but ultimately is speaking about the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. He speaks of it this way, that this Jesus was one whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. That's really the heart of the gospel. It is the phrase there that the Apostle Paul uses when he says propitiation, or as the New International Version once put it, a sacrifice of atonement. The actual word, hilasterion, is one that speaks in terms of, on the one hand, there is a sacrifice that is made, and then on the other, it is resulting in an appeasement an appeasement of wrath. That's the way in which the Apostle Paul interpreted the death of the Lord Jesus when he uses the phrase there, by his blood. That blood is not simply referring to bleeding, but it's referring to the actual bloody death that Jesus Christ underwent on that cross. And therefore, as we come to look at this, we, we need to, to bear in mind that if we to borrow the, the temple picture, we, we, we are dealing with uh, holy ground. We, we've moved from the, the common area. We, we're going into that place where uh, the, the sacrificial animal had its throat cut, and while it's kicking, its blood is oozing out. That's not a place you play. That's a place that says to you, there is death happening here. And then in the midst of that, that blood is then sprinkled upon the altar. That's where we have entered, and we are gazing at what God is doing there. The question that inevitably comes to mind is obviously, why? Why should we be staring at this death? What is it that makes it so vital? 
especially when we move away from an animal and we now look at the very Son of God. He that we've been learning about yesterday in terms of being God and man, learning about his gentleness and learning <clears throat> um, about his authority. And now we should be gazing at him hanging on the cross. Why? Well, that's what the first three chapters of Romans are all about. I won't take too much of your time there, but let's at least appreciate its background. And the Apostle Paul, upon rejoicing concerning this good news in chapter 1 and verse 16, he says there, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from, first, from faith for faith. And you will notice that in our Bible reading earlier, the righteousness of God was repeated at least three times. That's what Paul rejoiced in concerning this gospel. A righteousness that is literally from faith to faith or all by faith. In other words, we don't add anything to it. It's ours as we believe. But notice the reason he gives in verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. That's what necessitates the death of Christ. It's simply this. God is angry with humanity. Now, if that is not part of your theology, throw away that theology. It's dangerous. A God who's some kind of flabby grandfather who doesn't really care what's happening with his children and grandchildren morally is not the God of all eternity. The God of all eternity is one who is holy, he is one who is just. He is one who must punish sin. And that's the reason why when we go all the way back to the book of Genesis, that's what we are learning there. That God made our four parents, Adam and Eve, upright. But immediately after that, he said to them, essentially, I am holy, you must obey me. This you must not do. Well, the very thing he told them not to do, the eating of that fruit, they did. And death was God's pronouncement of judgment upon the human race. It was not a natural phenomena. It was God who had said, when you do this, you shall die. They did it, and he pronounced his judgment, and consequently death has come all the way from Adam to the present day. It is the wrath of God against humanity. But it's not just physical death. When you read the rest of the Bible, you soon see that there is also eternal death that awaits all sinners in this place called hell. And especially as you go to the end of the Bible, you can't miss the fact that God is deliberately making it clear that life as we know it now is not the end of all things. If you die unreconciled to this holy God, you simply go from this life and are cast into a place called hell. And at the end of all history, both death and the place of the dead will be thrown into the lake of fire. And that's where sinners must be for all eternity. Now that's the bad news. That's the background that necessitates this subject 
that we are dealing with this morning. It is the simple fact that there has been a judicial act on the part of God. And that act is one that is a pitch black midnight sky with no stars whatsoever to which we must finally go unless something is done. Well, that's really what Romans 1, 2, and at the end of uh, chapter 3, verse uh, 19 and 20, is all about. Let me read that last part to you. I'll just begin with uh, verse 9 of Romans 3. What then? Are we Jews any better off? Not at all. For we've already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. Allow me to just read up to verse 12 there. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good not even one. And then he says there in verse 19, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified or declared righteous in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. What Paul is saying there is that we are helpless and hopeless. Unless God comes into the picture, any effort on our part in religion and in good works and whatever else that we might seek to do finally simply shows us how sinful we are. Because if we are honest with ourselves, our consciences after our best works will still say to us, guilty, guilty, guilty. What hope then do we have? The answer is the death of Christ. That's the only hope that we have. And the Apostle Paul introduces it with the words, but now, in verse 21. But now. And he comes back, as we already saw in chapter 1, to this, the righteousness of God has been made manifest apart from the law. In fact, the original Greek simply says, but now, apart from law, Apart from any effort on our part to satisfy God, there's another righteousness that he offers from him, and it is free, totally free. And that righteousness is the one we are now learning about in verse 25 whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith, and there it is, this was to show God's righteousness. What is it, therefore, that is happening at the cross? This propitiation, as the Apostle Paul puts it here, what is happening? I want to suggest three words. And those three words, each one begins with S. The first is suffering. Suffering. Inevitably, when you think in terms of what was happening in the tabernacle or the temple, when a lamb was brought to be slain, there was death as the final end of intense suffering. It is a suffering unto death. And that's what we see when we look at the cross. 
Jesus himself said it a number of times. The Son of Man will suffer. He will suffer at the hands of wicked men, at the hands of Gentile leaders, at the hands of so many, but he will suffer. And when the authors of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels, when they bring us close to Calvary, you can't miss that when they slow down, they are enabling us to see that the Son of God suffered. Remember him saying a number of times to his disciples that my soul is in anguish almost to the point of death because of what awaits me. And even before he finally hands himself over to the soldiers, we see him going into Gethsemane, carrying first of all all his disciples, and then later on taking three and going with them a little further, and even then leaving them behind as he fell on his knees to pray. And three times over, he is pleading with the Father, Father, if it be thy will, let this cup pass away from me but not my will, but yours be done. And he was referring to the suffering that was coming before him, drinking the cup of the wrath of Almighty God. Finally, we are told that he prays with such intensity that his sweat becomes like great drops of blood falling to the ground. And God but sends an angel to strengthen him for the last mile of the way. Suffering. 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 But that's not the end. When he is finally arrested and goes through a mock trial, we are told that he's handed over to soldiers who beat him up with whips to the point where his flesh is but dangling from his body. In fact, Isaiah captures something of that in Isaiah chapter 52, going into chapter 53, and speaks in terms of the fact that he becomes totally unrecognizable. His figure is marred, he says, beyond human likeness. That's how Jesus Christ is treated, and then finally from there, in absolute weakness, he carries his cross. We know he fails to take it to its destination, and somebody has to help him. Well, crucifixion was an ugly form of death. I don't want to go into its details. But for Mary who stood there and looked up to at her son hanging on that cross, that would have crushed her spirit because he was suffering there. Until he finally cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? A cry of dereliction, a cry of sensing that I am forsaken. As he hung there, drinking in the wrath of God on behalf of sinners. And finally, he says, It is finished. He breathes his last and dies. Brethren, everything I've told you is in the text. I'm not filling in any gaps in between verses. It's what the authors of the four Gospels actually wrote down for posterity, and we read it. 
our savior didn't go to some kind of death chamber and first of all be rendered unconscious and then given some poisonous fluid to take him from this life into the next. He underwent suffering. But quickly, number two is substitution. Substitution. Because we ask the question, why should this Jesus bleed and suffer and die? Especially when we realize that he and he alone from the beginning of history lived a perfect life. Absolutely perfect. Not once did he sin in action, not once did he sin in word, not once did he sin in his thoughts, not even once. And he was able to challenge those that were seeking his destruction. Which one of you accuses me of sin? Point it out. He was born without sin. He lived without sin. The father was able to say about him towards the end of his life, this is my own beloved son in whom I am well, well pleased. So death had absolutely no claim on him, absolutely none. And then add to that the fact that he was and continued to be God. And God is immortal. God is eternal. God does not die. How do we then explain that death? Well, propitiation gives us the answer. He was the sacrifice of atonement. He was that sacrifice that would then take upon himself the wrath of God. And thus God would be appeased. Jesus Christ took our place. Friends, that's the good news of the gospel. It is about the fact that there is a righteousness that has been merited. Not by us, but by another with a capital A. And that another is the Lord Jesus Christ. He himself was born holy. We are told they in the scriptures that Mary was told that that holy one that would be born of you would be called the son of God. But more than that, he lived a perfectly righteous life. And then what did he do? Here's the good news. I love to picture it this way. He took off that righteousness like a jacket and put it aside then he took on another jacket, another coat, and it was our filthy rags. And with that, God then treated him on that cross as though we are the ones who were there. Jesus Christ, the innocent one, put into his account our debt, both D-E-B-T and D-I-R-T. He took it all upon himself, and consequently, this absolutely holy God, this absolutely just God, then poured his wrath upon his son to its very dregs because he took the place of his elect people. The entire sacrificial system of the Old Testament was fully fulfilled in what happened on that occasion. 
That's what all those bloody sacrifices, all those animals in their thousands upon thousands over history, in the life of the people of Israel, that's what they were pointing to. And that's why, as I said, we'll be learning about the marriage feast of the Lamb, with a capital L. He satisfied, rather he stood in our place. Let me quickly hurry on to the third S. And the third S is satisfaction. Complete satisfaction. Back to our text. We are told there, whom God put forward. It was an act of God. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. It's put forward as that sacrifice upon whom the wrath of God would come so that an appeasement can be achieved between sinners and a holy God. Through his blood, in other words, through his death as a substitute, we've already seen that. And then Paul goes on to say, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness, and here it is, at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. In other words, prior to this historic moment when Jesus Christ, the Son of God, expires and breathes his last, prior to this, there was an apparent contradiction. How can a mere animal be a substitute for human beings. How? You try it out. Be taken to court for some criminal activity. Be sentenced by the judge to 20, 30 years in prison. And then you say to that judge, Judge, I have a dog at home. It is precious to me. Can it take my place? The judge will feel insulted and might even extend your punishment a little. Really, at this point, God is now able to say, those were simply shadows. All those were simply pointing to the ultimate. Now, someone has taken the place of sinners, and listen to me, his life, his life is worth a million, million worlds. That's the value. Why? Because he is God who takes our place, the immortal dies. And so in that sense, justice is satisfied. Nobody, no angel in heaven would look at the throne and look at him who sits on the throne and say, how do you call this justice? An animal in the place of human beings made in the image of God? But now, as they saw God taking his sword out of his sheath and plunging it into the side of his son, his blood oozing out, the son crying as we heard earlier on, why have you forsaken me? And the answer being God so loved the world 
The angels close their eyes for a moment. There's darkness upon the cross. But when they do open, they are saying, he is just. This is the punishment that actually finally satisfies the living God. But that's not all. God gives the evidence of his satisfaction with the resurrection. The resurrection. To show that he is satisfied, he releases the Son of God so that death is absolutely vanquished. Now, this makes sense because if, if you ever borrowed money from the bank and it was based on your title deeds and you are slowly paying off that loan, you're, while you're paying it off, your, your title deeds are not in your hands. They're not in your custody. They're in the custody of the, the, the bank manager. And there's no point you heading back home to tell your wife I finished off the loan because I know what she'll ask you. Where are the title deeds? Prove it. But if you walk into the home and you throw it on her laps and you do a bit of African dance in front of her, <laughs> she'll understand. There is the evidence that the bank is satisfied, it's already paid for, now we can jump into the air with three shouts of hallelujah. Well, friends, that's what the resurrection is about. We don't need to doubt that God is satisfied. We don't need to doubt that our sins have been fully paid for. We don't need to doubt because three days after Jesus breathed his last, the grave, the tomb could hold him no longer. His enemies got a crack team of well-trained soldiers to guard the body it was all useless. It was all useless because Jesus Christ broke asunder the bars of death and was able to come out. Why? Because as the hymn writer says, death cannot keep its prey. Jesus, my Savior. He tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord. Up from the grave, he arose with a mighty triumph over his foes. He rose as a victor from the dark domain, and now he lives forever with his saints to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. So our Savior died. But listen to me. He is not dead. The cross is empty, yes, but so is the tomb. He has been raised from the dead and he is now seated at the right hand of the Father on high. And it is a truth that we need to hold dear. Because these two, the death and resurrection, go together. Look quickly at two verses, and with that I must close. First of all, at the very beginning of Romans chapter 1, the very beginning, as Paul is defining something of his gospel. He says there, Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, 
Paul is summarizing the gospel here, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness, and here it is, by his resurrection from the dead. So the death of Christ is part of the gospel, an essential part of the gospel, but we dare not end there. He rose from the dead. Or, as we now read at the end of chapter 4, at the end of chapter 4, as Paul wraps up his message concerning justification by faith, he says in verse 23, but the words it was counted to him were not written for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord. Notice, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord. But it doesn't end there. Who was delivered up, referring to the death, for our trespasses and raised for our justification. Brethren, the heart of our message is that bloody cross where Jesus, the Son of God, died as our substitute to satisfy the eternal, holy, and just God. And he did it. You and I can go to this Christ and own him as our Savior. And that's it. We don't need to ever tremble when death brings its cold hand and snatches us out of this life. It's a vanquished foe. Our Savior has borne the full price for our sin in that act of propitiation. God can be looked upon as righteous, totally vindicated, a loving God and a just God with no contradiction. Why? Because of that cross. Are you here this morning and you're still trying to come into good books with God through good works, religious activities, baptism, whatever else it might be? All that comprises filthy rags. Throw it away. And with open arms, embrace the cross where it's done. It's done, absolutely done. And rest in that alone. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, thank you that you came. Spirit of God, help us to appreciate more and more of what you have done for us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, on that cross. Amen.